on today's story beat number one trust yourself and that means learning how to listen to critiques and still go back to your own wisdom because if you get pushed off of your path it's very hard to get back on so trust yourself this is story beat with steve cuton a podcast for the creative mind story beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Hillary Sloan, is a journalist and documentary photographer living in the Mojave Desert. She researches, writes, shoots, and works as an event reporter for local radio station Z107.7 FM. Hillary was an advertising photo stylist with various skills in production, wardrobe, set design, and makeup for many years in Los Angeles. She worked for and with numerous celebrities and well-known photographers and directors until 2008 when she saw an opportunity to leave L.A. and move to Joshua Tree, California. Hillary's love for photography and writing inspired her to study journalism. She subsequently earned a certificate from Michigan State University. In 2017 and 2018, she traveled with Raleigh International, a British nonprofit, as their photographer. In 2020, she joined a group of world-renowned photographers working with consultant Christina Force, in which they share information and support. Hillary spends her free time photographing local wildlife around her home and dreaming up new projects that will take her into her community and beyond. For the record, Hillary and I first met while working on a play called Pièce de Résistance more years ago than either of us will own up to. Hillary designed the costumes and I designed the lighting and we've been friends ever since. So for all those reasons and many more, I'm truly delighted to have my dear friend, the multi-talented Hillary Sloan, join me today on StoryBeat. Hillary, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. It's so great to see you and to still know you after all these years. I know it's been a while and it's, it's really great to see you too. So let's go back in time for you. Creativity and artistry. I know from being around you are in your genes. You've been a creative and artistic person your whole life. When yes. did that artistic bug first bite you at what age? How young were you? You know, I have a distinct memory about eight. And I didn't know it was creative, but everything I looked at, everything I did had dimensions to it that other people didn't recognize. You noticed that you saw things that other people did not. Yes. I felt things. I saw things. I realized I was different. Mm -hmm. And you were different artistically, not just just a different person. (laughs) Artistic is what the word that finally I could place on the on me. Right. I can finally own that. But yeah, artistic people are different. Well, I think that's right. And you have obviously been involved in many different disciplines in creativity and the arts. And I'm wondering, were you multidisciplined as a young person as well? Or did you focus on one thing or another? Mm, Maybe multi, because in some way, there was a lot of struggle in my youth. I didn't know what I was going to be doing. And back in the day, women didn't have a lot of opportunities. I thought about architecture and was told women don't become architects. You know, I I liked clothing design. I used to cut out, you know, my doll, I'd take my dolls and put fabrics around them. But I never really had the opportunity to pursue it in a in a traditional way. I took some classes at FIT off and on over the years. What's FIT? Fashion Institute? Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. In New York. And you spent some time in New York as well, correct? I did. So my family was from New York and they moved to California when I was 14. Mm -hmm. And then I moved back at 18 and stayed there until I was about 29. And then I came home. What was it that brought you from New York back to L.A.? Was it did you want to be in the motion picture industry? 
I started to style in New York, so I was already in it. I think what drove me out of LA, out of New York, was cold weather. It was in the <laughs> middle of the winter. We were doing a shoot. And there were two shoots going on, one with vacuum cleaners. And I had to get <laughs> vacuum cleaners in different colors. I had to bring them from Macy's to the studio on 14th Street. And it was freezing. And the the streets were just solid ice. And I would go sliding down the street and my hands were, you know, cutting into the ropes. And I thought, there's got to be a better way. <laughs> there's got to be another <laughs> life out there. And ultimately, you wind up in a in the desert, which is not cold at all. Well, it is in the winter. You get a little chill out there right now. We can get snow out here. We're high. You're in We're the high. De you're in the high desert. I'm in the high desert. Right. So, all right. So, do you find that each of the disciplines that you've worked in, be it costume design, whether it's styling, whether it's photography, are they all of a piece in your creative thinking, or are is each one compartmentalized and require a whole different set of thinking? You know, recently I've decided or realized that they were all a piece in my thinking and in my education. In what way were they of a piece to you? How do they all fit together? Well, at one point, I thought that I just didn't have enough opportunity. There wasn't money to go to the right school. There wasn't things that I could do to become whatever successful is. But now I'm realizing that everything I did makes me who I am and trained me, you know, looking at color, working with great photographers, understanding design and costume. Um, somebody mentioned to me, I've been recently hired an editor to help me shape my stories. And she said, and I'm shooting, I'm photographing the Joshua Tree Music Festival. Right. And she said, I could see why you did that. You did costumes because these costumes are so part of this festival. And I said, it's kind of the other way around. When I did costumes, I would make up stories to costume people. I had to know what the character did, what they did years before the story began so I could get the right costume, the right fabric, everything about it. And that led me into going deeper into story. And it was probably story that has led my career. Do you think of yourself primarily as a storyteller? I do. So no matter what part of your craft, art, whatever you're doing, it is a way to tell story, yes? Yes. And do you think you were always that way or do you think you've only developed that over time? When I was much younger, up until maybe 18, I was very, very shy, which to people that know me, they wouldn't really believe that, but I was very shy and couldn't talk. You know, I wore my bangs down to here and hid a lot. So I don't know how that worked, except I wrote poetry and I hid out and I told myself stories to make the world comfortable. And there's also... To make the world comfortable or make your world comfortable? Make my world comfortable for me to be in. Mm-hmm. And then as I started to communicate, then I wanted to know what the world was about. So it was a way of learning. Would you say there's a discernible underlying theme throughout your work? Ah, oh, yes, absolutely. And what is that? You know, I'm going to digress just a tiny bit, but Christina Forrest talks about finding your why. And for a lot of creatives, unless you know why you're doing the work you're doing and what's propelling your life, your work does not come together. It could be totally scattered. And my why is, why are we the way we are? What is the world about? How do we become, how are we human? And what's the collective factor in that, the connective tissue to that? And so I your work is about, is about what makes us human? I think it is. Yes, absolutely. So when I look at your photography, and I've seen a bunch of it, and when I've read some of your work, and certainly when I've seen and worked with you in the past, I know that you love what you do. You you have a great passion for your work. How important is passion, and how much does it factor into what you do? Everything, everything, everything. You know, at one point when I was really struggling about three years ago, and I wasn't getting the work, the writing or the photography to the level I wanted. I thought about letting go and spending the rest of my life in a very quiet, just 
existing. And I couldn't. There's no way. <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> there's no way I could do that. Um, what I realized is I would pick up my camera anyway. And that was the most liberating feeling I had is that if nobody ever pays me, if nobody ever recognizes me, if nobody ever says, good, good girl, it doesn't matter. It's like breathing. Well, that's the, that's the creative person that you are. Yes. And you will create whether anyone sees it or hears about it or reads it or anything. I'm the same way. I, I totally get it that if you are truly a creative person, you create, and that's what you've been all about. Absolutely. So you mentioned that, and I mentioned that you were a stylist for many different photographers in LA for a long time and in New York. Explain for the listeners who don't know, what does a stylist do? What's a stylist? It's a photo stylist, really. And that's mostly for print and it's advertising. Although I did some film, I did a lot of theater. I did wardrobe, I did props, I did makeup, I taught character makeup, which is scars and wounds for many years. Um, I did production and casting. What I found with all those different things, and each one of them could be a direction, but what I found is that for my creative urges, I needed diversity. I'd get bored very easily, so I liked taking on more than I than I was used to, always moving. So as a stylist, it requires having that different bunch of skills and disciplines under your belt. Not always, because some style, well, stylist a little more than, say, a wardrobe costumer. Right. A costumer does costumes. A stylist will bring in costumes. They'll make a bed. They'll, you know, set up a, a shoot for still life. They'll do a lot of different things. You're setting the image, so to speak. Yes. So if you open any magazine and you see an ad, somebody put that together. And did you train for being a stylist or did you just do it? I just did it. I fell into it. How did you fall into it? How did that happen? So I was coming out to visit my folks over the years and they still lived in LA in the Valley. And I had a girlfriend, beautiful girlfriend named Jody that I loved a lot. And she had a friend, Phyllis Carlisle, who was an agent who worked with casting for Procter & Gamble and then went on and, and did more commercial casting. And one day I asked Phyllis, I said, I need a career. I don't know what the hell I'm doing in my life. Tell me about styling. And she said, call so-and-so. It was I think it was up at y and R. I don't remember who it was now. And he was not in, but his assistant was there. And she said, call Tony Petroselli, who was a photographer. And I did. And Tony hired me. Sight I, unseen, without knowing whether you could handle it or not. And I really couldn't handle it. It was so over my head. <laughs> That's the best way to learn, though, isn't it? Yes. You were, you were, you were dropped in feet first into the fire. I, I have that a lot in my life. <laughs> That's a recurring thing for you? Yes, very much so. Where you get in over your head and have to figure out how to get out of it? Or, or stay in it. Or stay in it or swim through it or whatever it would be, yes. Absolutely. That happened even at the radio station. When you were being a stylist, was there a moment when you then woke up, whether it was a month later or six months later or two years later, whenever it was, when you knew in your heart that you were actually good at this and you could do it and it was no longer, I don't know how to do this, but I'm actually decent at it. Was there a, an epiphanal moment like that? Yes. It was really fascinating after I worked for Tony for a while and Tony did a lot of uh, Rockwellian kind of ads, the Campbell soup with grandpa and the little girl sitting on his lap. And, right. And we did three sets a day and my father never finished anything. So I didn't come from a traditional home. I had no idea what a valance was and what curtains looked like up on windows. <laughs> <laughs> so I really struggled. And then I worked with Mark Kozlowski and it was a really interesting day. I had to find something. I can't remember what it was, something 
like a notebook, a leather notebook or something. And it had to be perfect. And I could not figure out what it was or where to go or how to get it. And in the struggle, something shifted in my thinking. It was almost like, you know, when you're under a lot of pressure and you can remove yourself. I don't know that it happens by choice, but you just, something switches inside of you and you move to a bigger vantage point. Is it like an out-of-body experience? It is. And all of a sudden, as I moved out of that experience and the stress of it, and it was probably late at night, cold winter, and I thought, oh, I get it. I just remember that moment. And then from that moment on, I knew I was in the right place for then and doing the right thing. And you, every job, though you would have experiences after experiences, every job was a unique one. Absolutely. And so you had to not quite reinvent the wheel every time, but close to it, correct? Close to it. And every job offered some sort of challenge. Later on, there was there was a certain comfort in certain things. I got known for period, for anything you know, from the turn of the century up until the 80s, which is when I was doing this mostly in the 80s. 90s. So the from the turn of the the 20th century. Yes. Yes. Uh, up to the 1980s. Right. And that was your specialty. People knew that they could count on you to find things uh, that were good for pictures, uh, imagery that that required that sort of look. Right. Or make it. I mean, I was also often called in to bring a like a box of fabrics and make things happen overnight. How much research did that require you to do? Constantly researching. I had books. I had things I tore out of magazines, notes. I'm not, I don't have a brilliant memory. So the names of things would <laughs> kind of evade me. But I mean, if you're doing World War I, it's a very different look than World War II and depending sure. where they are. And, sure. You know, um, recently, Laura Zucker, I worked a lot for the Back Alley Theater with Alan Zucker and Laura Zucker. And Laura's been posting. And every time she posts, for the most part, there are plays that I did. And it's, it's filled my heart with such joy to see them again and understand. And there's a certain magic. You were talking about interesting things that happened through my career. I was doing The Fox, the D.H. Lawrence play, The Fox. Yes. And I imagined this coat for the main character and I couldn't find it. I spent days searching. It was a man's coat. And I sat in my room, my apartment in L.A., just going, that's the coat. Nothing else is going to do. What am I going to do about that? I didn't have a budget to make anything. And all of a sudden, my assistant came over wearing the coat. <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, what did you do? How do you know? She just picked up the coat, put it on, rented it out of Western costume and came over. And w was that serendipity or was that an intentional thing? No, it wasn't intentional. It was serendipity. I had it another time. This lovely, brilliant friend of mine that I don't know if you knew ron oates was a set designer nope don't know ron and ron's since passed away but i was doing a play for a friend and it was a quirky odd you know little little short piece and he it's a man that turns huh, from a man to a chicken <laughs> and i got the costume down i drew it out i knew what i wanted but the only thing that would make it really work and readable, because this was a whole different level, like it had to read as a chicken, was that I needed a mask for him and nothing had already been created. So I was sitting in, again, sitting in my room thinking, mask, 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 where am I going to find it? Ronnie walked in with a card, put it on my desk. And it said mask maker. And I I think the man's name was Joseph Laughlin. It was beautiful. He was a beautiful mask maker. And I got the mask made and did the piece. 
just so the listeners will understand this, you were doing all this in the day and age prior to what we call the internet. And so right. you had to figure it out through what, either going to the library or buying books or gumshoe work where you're just on your feet looking in places. You couldn't go to some resource online and find a thousand different things at one time. You had to really get out there and work the streets. Absolutely. You talk to people, you find, I mean, Western costume back in those days was rich with these old timers that had been around from the beginning of movies, the hat makers and the shoemakers, and they're all gone now. I mean, they were kind of leaving the planet in the 80, late 80s, 90s. Well, late 80s. They retained the historical memory of Hollywood, didn't they? They did. And when they worked, we had Polaroids. They had a pencil and pad. Wow. You know, that's where we've all come from. They had a pencil. And now you have digital. Now you have digital. Now you walk into a place, take a picture with your phone, send it to the director, and, and away it's you all go. done. Yeah. So what for you, when you're working on a photograph, your own photograph, or when you were working for others, when you're designing a costume for a play, is there something in your mind that makes something good versus it's not right? Is there, is it just instinctive or is there something else involved in it? Oh, well, that's a great question. I mean, that you could ask any creative for that. There is something. But how do you describe that? There is something that makes something right. You know, there's this quote of Jackson Pollock. Somebody asked him when he knew he was done. And he said, it was like making love. How do you know you're done? You're done. And I think it's <laughs> that same sort of energy when it's right, when you allow yourself to talk yourself out of something. What do you like, mean by talk yourself out of something? Well, there are times when you're just tired, you've been on your feet for hours, you haven't eaten, you've gone to shops, you're just short of it being perfect. And you go, ah, it's good enough. It's not good enough. And you have to do that one more step, that one more hour, that one more day. And I mean, sometimes you don't get there. Your physical limitations just get in the way. Well, how often do you then stop for the day and come back at it the next day? Well, it depends on when they're shooting. So you're always working against some kind of a deadline. Right. And and that becomes immutable at some point and you either find it or you don't. Would you say that there were times in your career where you wound up doing good enough, but not exactly the perfect thing you wanted? Yes. And I hated it. I mean, it's Yes. And there were times also what I hadn't realized during all those years is that I had Lyme disease. Really? You had Lyme disease all that time? All that time. And so I was fighting exhaustion and um, I didn't find out about it until about, I don't know, 10 years ago here hmm. Wow. when I got here. And the difference that makes of not feeling like there's a cement wall on you. Well, that would make it a struggle every day. It would make it a struggle every day. It did. You're feeling better now, yes? Yeah, I'm great now. And All right. So what have you then learned over time about being a productive artist that you wish you had known from the start? What do you now do that you cut those corners that you early on you didn't cut that now make your life better or you realize about work itself? Is there anything that you wish you'd known from the start? <laughs> Again, it's a great question, but it's a funny one. No, there isn't anything. I think what I have learned to really be an artist takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, they talk about what, 10,000 steps. It takes time. And everything I have done has led me to this point. And maybe the only thing, if somebody could have said to me, just trust yourself, just relax, trust yourself. That's what I've learned. I think that's a big one for a huge number of artists. Absolutely. And even now, is everything I do perfect? No. Because we make mistakes. Well, of course, the question always is, what is perfect? Right, right. And if it's perfect tonight, it won't be perfect in the morning. Or next because week. I've learned. Or next <laughs> week, because I'm learning, hopefully. 
Well, yes. And as you grow, you grow in wisdom and you look back on some work. I know I do. You look back on work and go, really? I did that? Why? It could have been so much better. Uh, And then I look back on some stuff and I go, that was actually pretty good, all things considered. So art is is a little hit and miss, especially for the artist. Do you find that your work is, uh, like many artists, it's not precious to you? Oh, yeah. I hadn't thought about it that way. But yeah, once it's done, it's like, it's done. If I hold it too precious with photographs, it depends on the medium you're working in. Mm -hmm. If I, with photographs, there are things that become precious. And there's a whole school of thought about learning how to kill your babies. You know? (laughs) That goes back to Faulkner. You, yeah. You, you have to be willing to kill your darlings. <laughs> yeah. Throwing throwing stuff away so that you can then express more and that you learn what's really works. Well, we also know that sometimes, and actually more often than you can count, famous artists, artists who are very well known, people will go back and find what they threw away or what they discarded or what they put in a closet and didn't think anything of. And that turns out to be great work too. And the artist doesn't recognize it. Somebody later on recognizes it. Oh, but that opens up all kinds of categories. Again, what's great? What's a great Uh, Picasso? And what was that book that came out not too long ago? Um, With Gone with the Wind, it was the second book. And she hid it. The author hit it and somebody published it. Oh, found uh, Margaret Mitchell's second v- yeah. book. Yeah. So, yeah. and there was a question of whether, I didn't read it, but it was a question of whether it was really good. Well, there's the the number of artists who have de- have burned, dis- de- destroyed, thrown away, whatever, done something there to their work that later someone either found and saved or whatever. That's There's lots of that in the world. Well, let's talk about photography for a moment. You've been around photographers and cameras for most of your career, most of your adult life, basically. When did you get your first camera? Actually, when I went to the School of Visual Arts, I w- it must have been in my early 20s. I wasn't styling. I first thought I would go be a therapist. So I went to Bronx Community College and I was taking psychology and then realized that was so off the mark for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went to the School of Visual Arts and one of the basic classes were photography. But the the photography teacher told me, you're not technical, you'll never be good with cameras. Go be a stylist. And that's the first time I heard about styling. Huh, so that that pushed you toward that direction. It did. And did you at some point realize that you would be involved in photography or photographic work most of your life? Did that ever dawn on you or did it take a long time before you went, you know, I've been in photography a long time. It took a long time to understand it and to, to get that realization. It did. What did you learn early on from the great photographers you worked with? Cause you worked with many, what specific lessons did you learn that you have been able to use today? You know, it's a different world today. They were using film. So they had been very trained. And my ex-husband was a photographer. So, and he went to Brooks. So I understood the training that those photographers went through. They went through hours and hours. You, you shot film. You didn't know what you were going to get. I think the digital world helped me go into it. It made, could, it made it a little easier for you. Made it a little easier, yeah. And did, was there anything from the way that they handled themselves and the way they handled their subjects, the way that they handled the professional world that you have been able to adopt and adapt? Huh. Not when I started. I actually was very felt very different. I was... I wanted to do documentary. I started to realize that. And my photography was very gun and run, what they call. You know, I just picked up the camera, run and shoot. I didn't have a lot of technical knowledge. That teacher was right. And now being with Christina and those amazing photographers, um, some of them sat me down and said, you gotta learn your camera. (laughs) <laughs> you got to figure this thing out. You got to know 
what it takes. You got to know what you're going to go through and into. You have to know light. The men, they were mostly men, actually. There were some women, but that I worked with over the years, they had a huge crew. There was money. You know, I used to laugh. I mean, some of the wardrobe I did, like Coppola, when he did Cotton Club, what he had for shoes in one of those scenes, I had for an entire film <laughs> in budget. Yeah, sure. You know, what did I learn? I almost rejected everything I learned because it was so intense working that way. So you you think that you're working through your own thing? Yes. Your own way of doing it? Yes, definitely. And what have you learned about the camera in the more recent years? Well, I recently bought the mirrorless Nikon and I love it. And I'm sitting with my book that I should have done years ago and going through all of the menus and figuring it out. I'm learning about light in a whole new way. I'm hoping it never stops me to do something that's impossible, to shoot in the middle of the day or to shoot hard light or, you know, because I, I live in the desert. You and you, a lot and hard you light. have hard light. You have hard light. And when I was shooting in Africa, you had light people and dark people standing next to each other. You know, you had a lot of impossible things to work through. I mean, we had rules back in the styling days, no white, no black clothing. And well, I don't know. Well, why? Explain for the listeners why no white and no black and how that's changed today. You know, I'd have to think about it with film. I think it was the way the film registered the colors, but white would be blown out and, and black would absorb the light. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Same thing in the theater, by the way, with a little difference because, because the human eye is a lot more sensitive than any camera and it will see those distinctions but a camera might lose the black the blackness against the background and the white might stand out so much that you can't see everything else right exactly and when i was learning theater i had to study those theater lights because the colors of the theater were different you put blues and they reflected in a whole different way than uh, oh yeah well that's a that's why the Lighting designer, if they're any good, will have a long conversation with both the set designer and the costume designer and say, well, what's the color palette here? What are you doing? Because a lighting designer can then mistakenly put up the wrong colors that will totally destroy the look that the other designers are trying to achieve. Which is how we met. It, it is how we met. <laughs> we <laughs> you met were the lighting the designer. Yeah, that's exactly right. Light is everything for what you do. Pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have to have subject and context and uh, composition and all those things. But without light, you really don't have anything to start with. Right. Well, yeah. light and story. And story, sure. Story, you know, again, it depends on what you're doing. But I, when you're talking about theater, I mean, you can almost have a black stage and powerful actors start telling a story. 100% true. But you have to be able to see them and hear them. Eventually see them. Maybe, maybe like a minute or two before people lose. Well, sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can do something where you're in, in the darkness and people can be talking. You have to be able to hear it. Or you could have them in light and not hear them say anything. You can do both. But at some point, you're going to have all those things combined. It, would you say that your theater work and your stylist work has impacted and influences what you do now as a photographer? Oh, yes. And in what way? Mm, boy, that's so interesting. Well, on a practical sense, I think doing the styling work, I had to learn to work with people, all kinds of people in all sorts of situations. I mean, sometimes I would be on a football field shooting players and I'd have the wrong shoes for some odd reason and I'd have to go run into the into where the real players were and borrow their shoes. <laughs> so, you know, talk about getting over being shy. I had to learn to say, please, I need it. One of the early 
jobs that I did, somebody wanted to do a cookbook and it was Georgian peasants and the food they ate that let the, allowed them to live so long. Well, I love the, the, the wrinkles and the faces and we weren't going to get that, you know, we weren't going to get those kind of people. So first of all, I found out that it were Georgians living in New York. I went and knocked on their door and borrowed the clothing. <laughs> and then I hung out at the theatrical makeup stores and learned how to do aging makeup. And I took a friend of mine and, and made him look like a hundred year old man. <laughs> so I guess... I don't know if in, in a practical sense, the lighting, the clothes, the, the textures, everything informs what I do. I'm sure it does, but it's not so conscious. But the ability to keep showing up and getting past yourself and learning about people. So your pictures today that you take, I'm guessing, by and large, if not 100%, are not staged the way you would have in the old days in a studio, right? Right. And so you're you're you are still running and gunning to a certain extent. Um, lately, I've been working on portraits because I love faces, and so the portraits have to be a little bit more staged. I mean, sometimes I can just catch somebody and say, "Hold still and shoot," but often I'll put up a backdrop and I'll look for the light. Do you costume, costume them as well? I haven't because we're so far from stores. Mm -hmm. So I've stayed away. I still have my makeup supplies, but, you know, I've been out of it so long. I'm not, I don't feel comfortable with so it. So when you traveled to Africa, you weren't staging anything. You were taking what you saw. Oh, that, that was all documentary. All documentary. And a large part of what you do in Joshua Tree is also documentary. Mm -hmm. And is it more challenging to do things that way? Or would you prefer to stage things? Or do you like doing what you're doing? It's very different. I have a really close friend, Bob Stevens, who is an amazing photographer. And I used to work with him 40 years ago. And we met recently in Christina's class. And we talk a lot about, you know, the old days and now. And everything he did was staged. Everything was crews. He he paid tech people and lighting people and makeup people. And, you know, I carry all the equipment myself. Every once in a while, I can kind of coax a young kid to help me. But <laughs> it's really me. It's very different. Do you carry a lot of lighting and, and so on with you? I've started to, yeah. And it gets very heavy. Yeah, we get a lot very heavy. Yeah, it's not like what they used in studios, but it could be used in studios. I use a Pro Photo B, a B two, so the, it's a small pack. And this is and that's a, is a that a, is that a strobe? It's a strobe, yeah. It's a strobe, so you're able to take pictures pretty much. Any, do you do you carry a backdrop with you? Sometimes I have a small one that folds up, and it has a stand. So I have a jeep. I throw everything in my four wheel drive jeep and run out to the desert. Wow. Very interesting. Do you find that when you're working that you are just trying to bring all of the world into you or are you looking for things as you're going? Mm, I think I'm looking. You're yeah. looking for things. Do you seek composition or is it pretty innate for you? Wow, I see composition and that's beginning to change with the influences of the advertising photographers I know. Mm -hmm. They're helping me so much. You know, they'll point out things like go wider so you have more to work with or why didn't you crop in here? You don't need all that excess. And, and the thing with art is that it never is static. You, you've never arrived. Oh, for sure. If you've arrived, you're done. You're done. I mean, there are people that do a look and then they get known for that look and they keep producing it. I'm not that kind of artist. You keep evolving. Maybe they're evolving too. I don't want to say one's better or worse or one's evolving and one isn't, it, but it's very different. It's, I'm, a, yeah. it, it's a taste thing. That's all taste. Yes. You know, yes. do, do you like this picture? Do you like that picture? That's you could ask 20 people and they'd each give you a different an answer. So when you are working, 
do you give yourself assignments as opposed to as opposed to someone hiring you? Do you give yourself assignments? Well, both. So my journalism also gives me assignments. I'll I'll seek out stories. You know, um, with the music festival, I ran into Barnett, who Barnett English, who puts it on, and I said, Barnett, I want to shoot for you, and he said, Okay, so. I got to hang around and I'm still shooting it. Um, They're going to have another festival. And when I was there, so we began with the builds when they were building the sets and they were putting everything up and then it went into the festival. And that was such a learning because I could shoot a lot, but I couldn't get all the performers in the right way. I didn't have enough equipment. So I've had to go buy more lenses. What, to get wider? Well, no, to get longer, to get, uh, well, the lens I just bought was a 2470 and it's a 2.8. So I can work in lower light. Lower light. Yes. Well, that's important, especially if you're, if you are a run and gunner, you need to be able to capture odd lighting setups. Right. And you can't use flash, not in something like that. First of all, it's too big. Too the big. Whole- the whole arena is large and often performers don't want flash in their face. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have a particular atmosphere that you like to try to achieve in a shoot like that? Is there something that you do? Do you set use music or do you tell jokes or is there anything that you do to set an atmosphere? Yes. And sometimes it backfires. (laughs) Um, (laughs) What I have done in the past is try to get to know somebody. So I'll talk. And then you have to be careful because you're catching them with their mouth open or in the middle in mid sentence and it doesn't, it looks wrong. And I have thought in the past, well, then I'll just come back again the next day. And because nobody's paying me, I can do that. But when I'm getting paid, when I'm on assignment, I can't do that. So back in the day when people were shooting on film, um, there was a comparatively limited amount of pictures you could shoot before you had to change film. Right. To, today, you can shoot literally thousands of pictures before you have to change the whatever the memory, uh, the memory devices, card, yeah, the memory card, whatever that is that you're using. Do you find that you shoot a lot, a lot of pictures and then go choose what you want later? Or are you very careful in how you actually press the, the button? Lately, I'm shooting less. In the beginning, as I was learning, I shot and shot and shot and didn't care. You know, now it's um, there's something about the expediency and the precision of it and really choosing. And when you were asking me about do I seek it, what I seek is to connect to the to a human or even to the landscape. Both. I know some brilliant landscape photographers who will go out like in the park and sit. They'll wait for the right light and they'll wait for that moment. They're, they're communing with the Well, with Ansel Adams famously waited for weeks or months even for the right light. Mm-hmm. You just wait, you go out and camp out and just wait until he found what he wanted. <laughs> so that's dedication when you're doing that kind of thing. When you are preparing to shoot, do you have a vision in your mind's eye as to what you want, or are you just trying to find it as you're going? That too is evolving. I'm trying to work more to where I know what I'm going to get. Before that, I had no idea that that's learning your camera, learning lighting. You, you have no idea. Your work is more intentional as you grow. Yes. As opposed to finding it. When you're running and gunning, you're finding it. But intentional work means you're actually contriving. I want to put the camera here at this specific time for that specific shot. Right. So I, there's a swap meet uh, project I'm doing, and I haven't been able to really get that project moving yet because I've had to think about what kind of portraits. There's a lot of characters out there, and people bring all this junk, and there's something so gorgeous about the communication be- be- between people and stuff. And when I've been thinking about this, I've thought about setting up a booth. So inside a truck or actually something with walls and a a scrim, which is a screen that goes overhead to cut the light because you're working 
from say six in the morning till maybe three in the afternoon, you're dealing with wind, you're dealing with not a lot of rain, but possibly rain and lighting, shifting lighting conditions. Mm -hmm. That could be very difficult. So I have gone out there and spent, I've been working on it for about a year and I have photographs, but they, the project is informed yet because I can't control it yet. Would you say that that's creating a conundrum for you or is this just part of the process? It's just part of the process. It's part of the process. So without naming names, have you had difficult or challenging subjects or uncooperative or giving you grief or something like that, even when you were back being a stylist or even today? Um, and how would you deal with those if someone was not being terribly cooperative? <laughs> I remember it. Okay. So in my photographs, if somebody doesn't want to be photographed, I walk away. Right. Because that's it's a whole different thing. When I remember back in the days, and I think it's something we did together where I was having a lot of difficulty and I just burst into tears. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now is that the best answer? No. But, no, no, that's not going to solve the problem too often. <laughs> but that's maturity and experience. Um, what I would say as a journalist, you need to find ways to to allow somebody or get somebody to open up and reveal to you. And if one person won't tell you, somebody else might. So, so let's explore that a moment. When you are on an assignment as a journalist, or do you make your own assignments and then sell them? Both. You do both. You both pitch assignments and you receive assignments. So I have what's called a beat. I cover the Yucca Valley meetings, the town council and the planning commission. And that's you're both taking pictures and writing about them. Well, pictures are just with my cell phone and just to capture a quick image of the meeting. I see. So I wouldn't say that's about photography. That's about writing. This is and about my, writing. Good. And Good. recording. And, and then recording. I in, yeah. Then I walk into the studio and I read the story. So when you are developing a story like that or any of the stories on your beat, how long does it take to develop them? What do you do? Tell us your process. How do you start? Aside from you got to, oh, here's the story. When you figure out there's a story in something. I guess it depends what I, I'm finding little tricks these days. Let me take the, the music festival, for instance. I'm working with an editor now and I have lots of photographs. Those are, and some really good photographs, things I'm very proud of. And I'm looking for the story underneath it. So I have a hunch. So I've recorded, I do interviews, I record, I have an app and it will transcribe the interview and give me a text. Right. Then I can read it and I can take pieces of it and transpose it into a different page. I'm so visual that if something's too crowded, if type is too crowded, I can't make sense out of it. So I've also learned about how I work, how my brain registers material. Mm -hmm. And then I will, I will take quotes and I will go back and I will study the person, the photograph and the quotes. And that leads me deeper into the story. And then maybe, maybe the next time I go out, because the festival's happening in March again, then I can um, know what I'm going for instead of looking for it. Again, more intentional. More intentional. And how much writing do you do to present or to prepare a a piece? Is it a lot of writing to then cut it down to less? Or do you pretty much write to what you need? For the radio, you write to what you need. I mean, you just, you have, you don't have a lot of time and you don't have a lot of recording time. My stories have to be under a minute. Oh, they're, so they're really snippets. There are snippets. What I can do is give, if I have more to say, I can do a bigger story that will go online. Right. So I send it to one of the other reporters and they put it up on the website. Are you always working on a deadline of some kind? Yes. And so that forces your hand quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And what's the shortest turnaround you've ever gone from? I have the material. I have to write it and prepare it. What's the shortest it's ever been? Every Tuesday night, I go to those meetings, I come home, 
I write, I get out of the meetings anywhere between, well, around eight o'clock. I've got to write it. I've got to transcribe it, write it, print it, and go to the studio. And I certainly want to get out of there early enough to go get some sleep. So it's it will be late-ish at night. Yes. And how many drafts typically do you go through before you're ready to read it? Well, you're at it all the time. You know, you're cutting out words you don't need. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they're, I don't think of it as drafts on something like that. Now, if I'm doing a long piece, you do do drafts. I don't, I don't know how many drafts it would take, but, but I did a lot of classes with some really great reporters who have, Society for Environmental Journalists and Pointer. And there's a way to start spotting what you're saying and see, is this important? Does this move the story? If not, lose it. it well, when you're doing a minute long story, you've got to be very critical on what you're, what you're writing and what you're going to say, because you've got to get the whole thing into a very short time. I've for long said that, and it's not just me saying it, but I mean, I've long believed that Short story writing and short storytelling is the most difficult kind of storytelling. Now, some would say, no, it's really writing a long novel and so on. Well, that's that's just the, the ability to stick to it over a long time. But I think if you can tell a story in a very short window, you are really doing something very difficult to do and very special. I think you have to really understand it. With the meetings, I've never been particularly political or interested in government. So it took me a while to figure out how to cover a government meeting and what was important and, you know, the the abbreviations they use. So now I've been doing it quite a while, over a year, it's getting easier and easier. Do you find that because you're, you're uh, reporting on the government that you have people that don't like what you're saying? Do you have people that are upset with things that you write? I haven't found that yet, mainly because I'm just really recording what's happening. You're telling it like giving, it is. Yeah, I'm not giving an opinion piece here. It's, you not, know? it's not slanted in any way. No, no, it, there's no opinion. So now people get upset at all sorts of things. So. I can't be accountable <laughs> for people's moods, but generally uh, I'm finding people are fine. All right. Now I'm curious. How do you think that your writing, your design abilities and your photography abilities, how do they influence each other? You know, this I thought about earlier before we spoke. And what I think it is, is who I am and how I live. When I came out here and found this little cabin and, and this garage and made it into a home, what I understood, because it was the first time I had that ability to do, that I have a great design sense and things like space and lighting were all very relevant. And my environment contributed to letting me be a better artist. So in this space, I can write, I can look at my photographs, I can set up portrait sh shoots. So it's who you are as an artist and how you live your life. That's the visual end of it. How does that impact your writing? Uh, if it does at all, it might not. I think it does, but I don't, I'm not sure yet. But I think everything, you want to tell a story, I want to communicate. That's been the the impetus for everything I've done. Well, again, going back to you are a storyteller, whether you're I am a it, storyteller, whether you're telling it in pictures or whether you're telling it in a the costume design or whether you're telling it in the way you set up your house, you are a storyteller. And that comes out in your writing as well, obviously. So my writing does influence my photographs. In what way? Well, what I'm finding now, and again, the encouragement by of people I really respect is the more I can write to my story, the more I know what I'm going after and the more, con not control, but what's the word you used before? Uh, intention. Intention. 
That's such a great word, the more intention I have. So sometimes I do pages and pages and throw them away. Mm -hmm. I don't keep it about, why are you photographing this person? What do you see? How does it affect you? How do you feel? What's the coloring? What's the lighting? You know, and where I have felt a little bit not in control is that each photograph came out very distinct and different. And now I'm looking, the bigger the story, the more I'm looking to unify it. So how do you unify it? You unify it with story and with color and with lighting. Well, not always lighting, but the color, the tone you put on all the photographs, maybe the size of the photographs and how they piece together one after another. And I can, if I write to that, I have a better understanding of what I'm doing. So we are now in a day and age where you can manipulate words in the computer much more readily than you could when you had a typewriter or when you were writing longhand on paper. Um, it's the same thing for photographs. You have the ability to manipulate them in the computer if you wish. Do you digitally enhance your photographs or do you put them out raw? No, I, I enhance them or or I make a choice to let them stand as they are. But mm -hmm. Raw means all the information and nobody could open them. So you, you don't send anything out that way. You, when you, you say, when you say no one can open them, you're saying because the file size itself would be gigantic. Right. So you then do things to manipulate. Do you also work with color and light in the computer? Yes. You are using filtration or lighting changes or whatever you're doing in the computer in order to make the, the photo more to your liking. Right much as you would write a piece and keep taking words out or adding words or massaging the sentence or the paragraph or whatever, you're also massaging or manipulating the photograph as well. Right. And you're thinking of lighting. So, and you're thinking of color, tone, quality, if something's oversaturated or undersaturated, you know, so costume, do I bleach out a dress if I want to get a feeling of poverty or that this dress has been worn a lot, it's very loved by somebody, then I'm going to wear it out. I'm going to take it and, you know, scrape it and sand it and distress it, distress it. That's a, I love that word in the theater. You distress objects. <laughs> <laughs> I remember taking gorgeous motorcycle boots and running over them with the car to try to get them. <laughs> 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 to look soft like a soft leather like they'd been worn a long time right indeed all right so how do you refresh your well what do you do to keep yourself you know with energy and verve and vigor what do you do to refresh yourself mm. meditation quiet time i mean whatever that meditation looks like it could be a you know a, a meditation or i could just sit quietly and being out here does it for me. I have five acres. I can just walk out. I don't have people banging on my window. I don't hear the opera singer from the building next door. <laughs> I have bunnies and, you know, road runners. And that, it refreshes me like I, I would have never known. Just being in nature. To be in nature. You're much more in nature than when you were in Los Angeles. That much I can tell you. Absolutely. I remember Los Angeles. Yeah, you're not much in nature there unless you in, you seek that out and drive somewhere to get to nature. Well, I used to do a lot of hikes, but I had a hard time sitting quietly in LA. It was too much I, energy. Yeah, New York was even more. So the energy in the desert is a much more relaxed, peaceful energy. Much more peaceful. In, indeed, it, it, it certainly must be. I've been speaking for the last hour plus to my good friend, Hilary Sloan, who has led an entire life of artistry and continues on with that. Um, and I'm wondering, as we wind this thing down, uh, you've worked with so many people and you've had many experiences. And I'm just wondering if you can share with us uh, an experience that you've had that's either weird, quirky, strange, offbeat, or just plain funny. Oh, I've had so many, but the one is I worked with Vincent Price for, for a while. 
I met him in the later part of his life. I think it was after he did that movie. Was it the Whales of August? With I, that's a good one. I don't know the answer to that question. Oh, I'm not sure if that's the name, but it was with Betty Davis, I think, and John Crawford. I mean, he, he, it was a great movie. That's after why they he, invented the IMDb. Right. And Google. <laughs> and Google. <laughs> but also it was after Edward Scissorham. Okay. And he was doing Disney, independent Disney projects. So we got to work very one-on-one -on -one. and sitting with him in the in the dressing room. I did makeup, I did wardrobe, and hanging out with him. We're talking about an icon. Mm -hmm. And a generous man. Everybody, he'd walk into the studio and shake everybody's hand. And one day he said to me, you know, they wanted to send a car for me and they don't trust me. I said, Vincent, that's not it. You're a star. <laughs> You're a star. They're sending a car for you. He was so down to earth. You know, he still bought it Target. <laughs> oh, I'm having a hard time picturing going down an aisle in Target. And there's Vincent Price. <laughs> I heard so many stories of people saying they saw him in the grocery store and <laughs> turn around and shake their hand and say hello. <laughs> and he was very, very artistically inclined and also a collector of great art. I think he even tried to draw early on, but he was a cook. You know, everything he did, he was a wine connoisseur. He worked for uh, Jacqueline Kennedy, putting together the art collection for the president. Well, he had great taste. Yeah, but he had insight. He worked with the um, the Native American nations. and oh, oh, he did? I didn't know that. Yeah, for Kennedy. That was one of his jobs to go around to all of the reservations. Now... I had just found out after being with a Society for Environmental Journalists that Oklahoma has no reservations because they were given the whole state until we walked in yet again and took it back. Took it over. Yeah. Yeah. But he had, he was amazing. Well, was, I, I wish I had had a chance to meet him. I'm glad you did. All yeah. right. So last question for today, Hillary. Um, you've already given us all kinds of very interesting thoughts to chew on and lots of advice um, so far, but I'm wondering if you have a solid piece of advice or a tip that you can lend to those who are just starting out in any aspect of the industry that you've worked on um, and, or those that are in a little bit and are trying to get to the next level. Yes, I can. Number one, trust yourself. And that means learning how to listen to critiques and still go back to your own wisdom. Because if you get pushed off of your path, it's very hard to get back on. So trust yourself. Also, if what I would say to my younger self was patience. Just patience, patience, patience. If you're not getting the response you want, doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just not its right time. And some things, I mean, I worked for years feeling at times that nothing was ever going to work. And then when things work, you're much more humble by the moment. You're not thrown off and caught up in your ego. You know, so in some ways, what did all of those careers take me to was to understand that there were lots of steps I had to go through. And um, that was a great help. Well, I think that's extremely wise advice. You're what you're basically saying is you need to learn to develop who you are and what you're about because not everybody is fully developed and ready to go at the beginning of a career. Right. And you have to develop and learn your own voice. That's what you're talking about as well in terms of what you're doing with your photography and your writing is that you're developing your own voice. Mm-hmm. I think that's very wise. Hillary Sloan, this has been a fantastic hour plus on Storybeat. And I am so delighted to see you again. And, I, you know, I, I'm just thrilled that you spent some time. Thank you, Steve. It was, it was delightful for me. I'm very excited. Now I'm going to be bouncing a little off the walls. Like, <laughs> 
I'm charged. Well, don't, don't bounce too hard. <laughs> Soft landing, okay? That's right. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Story Beat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.